receive from Him. Be filled up by Him. And then there's an overflow in your life of God's power. Not because of your biceps, but because of His overflow. Because you're filled with Him. And this is how it works. And we can argue this and use different terminology and semantics and all that stuff. But the bottom line, Paul asked the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? And then text here asks us the same question. Have you received him? Do you feel like a dry branch on a tree? I believe that many of us here tonight do. And you remember those times of real life and vibrancy when God was doing great things and just things were happening in your life, and God was orchestrating things, and you were there because the Spirit was leading you, and He was empowering you. But we become neglectful. Things get busy. We surround ourselves with mortgages and children and careers and all those good things, and we neglect that spiritual need that we have. And there's a Lord who beckons us to enough tonight and says, Have you been there? It's available to you. You only need to ask. And tonight, when we finish, I'll remain up here. And if you want the baptism of the Spirit in your life, I will gladly lay hands on you and pray with you and believe with you that the Lord will be true to His promise. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So the first thing we read about here in Ephesus is that Paul recognizes that in at least 12 of these men, they needed the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit was given. Now, it's interesting, Paul goes into the synagogue and he preaches. But they don't seem quite as enthusiastic about him being there as they had been months and months earlier. And some of them, we read here, were hardened. See, there's a tendency that when people hear the gospel, one of two things happen. Either you become sensitive and pliable to the Spirit, or you become hardened to the Lord. The same sun that melts the wax also hardens the clay. And the issue is what is the nature of the material? Some people's hearts grow harder. Some people's sensitive hearts become more sensitive to the Lord. Well, there were those in the synagogue who became hardened. They began speaking evil of the way. Or what? That's the first name of Christianity. But it was the way. Christianity was seen as a sect of Judaism and it was called the way. And so they began to speak evil of the way in front of people, in public, and so Paul departed from the synagogue. And instead he began reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, what's the school of Tyrannus? Well, we don't know. <laughs> but it was not uncommon for teachers and philosophers of this day to have their own schools. And those schools would teach in the morning and then break for the hottest hours of the day, let's say you know, late morning to early evening, and then pick up again in the evening. And so Paul, it looks like, would rent this particular facility in those off hours, and he would teach the Bible there. We read this day that he taught there for two years. It's like Paul had a Bible college and discipleship school going on in the midday hours. So the first thing we see regarding what's going to happen in Ephesus is that the Holy Spirit is being given and the Word of God is being held in high esteem. See, Paul's reasoning there <coughs> for two years and all who dwelt in Asia heard the Word of the Lord. Both Jews and Greeks. Now when we say Asia, it's not saying all of Asia Minor, but the region in which Paul was in, everybody was hearing about what was going on. And that tells me then as Paul was reasoning teaching in the school of Tyrannus, that those, he was te those that he was teaching were going out also, and they were teaching, so that the whole area became saturated with the gospel and with the scriptures. 
See, there's a, there's a revival that's about to happen in Ephesus. Those of you who know the story. We see the Holy Spirit being given, but we also see a high view of God's Word. And that's not a common thing in churches today. It's becoming less and less common. We go to a church and say, do you teach the Bible? Oh, no, we don't teach that. <coughs> well, what do you teach them? The Shack. The latest bestseller on the Christian book list, Joel Osteen books or something. What, what are you teaching then? Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Joel Osteen. I can squint like him too. <laughs> Man, scrape that off that you <laughs> But for heaven's sake, if you're not teaching the Bible, then what are you teaching? Paul taught from the scriptures for two full years. That's like one book in my face. But he was teaching daily. That's six days a week in the Jewish mind. And people were coming. And they were listening and they were taking it out with them. Good things are happening. And the entire region is being affected by it. Now verse 11, another criterion you might say. This is sort of the anatomy of a revival. That's probably what we would call this. Verse 11, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. And the diseases left them and evil spirits went out of them. So beyond Paul's gift to teach, the Lord was also performing some very unusual miracles. It says that handkerchiefs, what we would call sort of a face cloth, or an apron, which I know when we say apron, we think, you know, the baker's apron, but that's really a sash that was worn as a belt. It said when these were taken from Paul and, and handed out, that people were being healed and, and, and demons were, were being cast out. And I don't believe for a second, I want to qualify this, that um, the handkerchief or the sash in and of itself had the power. I want to make that clear because when I got saved, I started watching some of these guys on television. And they were always on late night cable and early morning cable stations. And if I just sent them a hundred dollars that they would be faithful to send me a magical prayer handkerchief or a bottle of holy water or some, some anointing oil or Sinaway spray or something they, they were peddling and somehow that, that was going to sort of, you know, enrich my spiritual life and I'd be super powerful spiritually because I paid a hundred dollars for this guy's handkerchief. You laugh, right? But those of you who were around in the 80s and saw that stuff coming apart in the early 90s, you know what I'm talking about. And people become fixated. Oh my goodness, I need one of those handkerchiefs. I was listening to Joe Poach. How many of you guys listen to Joe Poach's radio? That, that was, my goodness, that program was so good. 12 o'clock noon, there's another shameless pitch there. <laughs> but he was talking about when you know, not long after he got saved, there's a guy on TV selling miracle wallets. And every time you reach in, you know, to your wallet, there would always be money in there, you know. <laughs> How many of us could use one of those, you know? <laughs> but if the preacher had one of those, why is he begging for money on television? He just had to reach in his wallet and take out another 10 or $20 bill. He'd been fine. The stuff... It's true, it's almost like we become dumber when we become believers. <laughs> some of the stuff that we believe, can I say that? I don't mean that insulting. I mean it kind of comically, but sometimes we become so gullible. Because we become focused on miracles and not on God. And I don't believe that Paul was selling miracle handkerchiefs here. Or little vials of oil or holy water. I mean, any of that gimmicky stuff. I don't believe that's what this was about. I believe this is a lot like the, the woman who's hemorrhaging, who grabbed a hold of Jesus, the hem of his garment. It, it, she looked at Jesus' authority, the authority of a rabbi was expressed in the hem of his garment. And so she grabbed a hold of his authority. Faith without action is dead, right? So she goes and she grabs a hold of what she understands and, and she's healed. And I believe that 
people aren't looking to the handkerchief, it's a point of contact, but they're looking towards the power and authority of God as it was at least delegated to Paul. And if that seems strange to you, please understand that the Bible here even says these were unusual miracles. This was unusual, even in the first century church. Some believers, gang, listen, they focus on miracles. They seek miracles, but they don't seek after God's will. But I dare say that if we were operating in God's will and operating in the power of the Spirit, that we would seek the miracles, amen? I believe that the 21st century church can be just like the 1st century church if we would just depend upon Him. I really do. I don't believe that the spiritual gifts ended in the 1st century. I think Peter's dissertation in Acts chapter 2 makes it very plain that it's for successive generations. But I'm not going to follow after miracles. I want to follow after my Lord who said, pick up your cross and follow me. That's what I'm following after. But I'm seeking His will and His power. And if He wants to manifest His power in miracles, and so be it. But I'm not going to follow after the miracles. I'd rather that the miracles follow after me. Amen? Amen. And I think that's the Lord's will, that the miracles will follow after you too. And whether that's people being healed, or demons being cast out, or lives being radically saved and transformed, let us see. That it will be when we do His work, His way, and in His power. Amen? Amen. Amen. Psalm 72 verse 18 says, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. That's the God I'm looking to. Who only does wondrous things. If it's less than wondrous, it's probably me. If it smells of perspiration, it's probably the flesh. If it smells of inspiration, it's probably him. Amen? All right. So, things that we've seen then in Ephesus so far, the Holy Spirit's been given. There's a high uh, view of God's Word, and His Word is being taught and moving throughout the region. We see unusual miracles, and now, verse 13, we see spiritual warfare is on the rise. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who have evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Now, when we think of or exorcisms, we usually think that in a Christian or Catholic kind of context, don't we? Probably because of those horrible movies from the 70s and stuff, you know, and the priests and the crucifixes and all that kind of stuff. But the casting of, out of demons happened within Judaism as well. And remember that before the way, or before Christianity, there was, God was operating in the context of Judaism. Well, among these Jewish exorcists then, that they were operating at the time, there were these seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest. He was probably the chief priest of the synagogue, or at least a high-ranking priest within the synagogue there in Ephesus. And he had seven sons. <coughs> And so they say, hey, wow, we see what's going on with this guy, Paul. He keeps preaching this Jesus, and, and, and the demons are being cast out, so we should be able to do the same thing. But there's a difference, because Paul's authority was delegated to him by the Lord. These guys were just trying to assume the Lord's power. See, it's the Lord who casts out demons. You and I can't do that. You understand that, right? People say, well, I'm going to cast a demon out of your brother. And he starts rolling up his sleeves. Don't go there. <laughs> All right? If he has to roll up his sleeves, it has something to do with it. It's the Lord's power. Matthew 8, 29. We read of the demoniacs. It says, suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? And you see that throughout Matthew and Mark in once in Luke where demoniacs possessed people look at Jesus and the demons recognize right away who he is and they become scared. The demons believe, says James, and they tremble. 
These men didn't have faith in Jesus' name. They were just trying to draw Jesus. That's what was going on. Trying to use his authority to cast out demons and make themselves look as though they were something that they weren't. It wasn't a true faith. Therefore, they didn't have the privilege of Jesus' power. And now they're tangling with something that they are not willing to deal with. You see, gang, here's the truth. There's no such thing as second-hand faith. You will not be saved because you knew a Methodist. <laughs> or because you knew a Baptist. Or because your mother was a devout believer. That's not a free ticket for you. Every person wants into heaven on their own and willingly. It's not an issue of pedigree. It's an issue of forgiveness. Amen? These guys didn't have that. They didn't have Jesus. They, they sought almost a utilitarian relationship with Jesus or with Paul's ministry. But they weren't seeking a loving relationship by faith. Verse 15, here's the key verse. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now, if you think in pictures, I'm terribly sorry you just saw that. <laughs> but can, I was going to say, can you imagine this in your mind? But don't. See, these guys were trying to cast out a demon, and the demon cast them out instead. The demon knew who Jesus was, and he even knew who Paul was. That's a privilege, don't you think? Can you imagine if you were on like hell's ten most wanted list? <laughs> There's Jesus number one, Paul number two, maybe you number three, or four, or five. What a privilege to be on hell's like familiarity list. You know you're effective when hell is taken notice of. And Paul was obviously very effective because the demon says, hey, we, even, we know Jesus, and we even know of Paul, but you know what? Never heard of you. <laughs> they had no respect for the seven sons of Siva. And they were then completely overwhelmed by this demon. Gang, I've got to tell you, the spiritual war is real. We talk about spiritual warfare, but some of us, we don't really think about it that much. But it's a real deal. And it really happens. Last Saturday morning, I did not cast out a demon or beat up a demon. I just want to say that. <laughs> but last Saturday morning, do you ever wake up and it's like the devil's just on your shoulder right away, just trying to push stuff into your head? Well, you know, I've only been a shepherd for 10 years now. But I've, I've been hanging out with sheep for 10 years. And when you hang out with sheep for 10 years, you begin to. <coughs> understand how she think because you're also a sheep yourself. And you know, sometimes little criticisms come back to me. And you know, some of that had happened. And so I just woke up Saturday morning and right away it's on my mind. So and so said something about me. So and so said something about the church. So and so said this. So and so said this. And you know, I, I try to be faithful like Paul says in Philippians 4. He says, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. So I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to push those thoughts out of my mind and think of just noble things and godly biblical things and pray through this. And it's just like I couldn't get rid of this demon on my shoulders just throwing this stuff into my head. And all afternoon, and then I'm trying to pray before I come and preach, and guess what's going on? This mental battle. And I've never experienced it quite to that degree. And then Saturday night at the church, man, the devil's on the move. Sunday morning I wake up, it's all over again. There's a real spiritual war. And the battlefield is the mind. But in some areas of the world, it's physical. You, South Africa, South America, in the Far East Asia, Southern California. <laughs> Man, this is crazy. And you, you think I'm laughing? I was in a Costco. When my kids were little, Sandy and I went to Costco. That's what we did on Saturdays. Because if you've been to Southern California, you know you don't feed your kids on Saturday. You just go to Costco and you go up and down the aisles and you just try all of them with freebies, right? So, 
So usually you go around there twice, you're stuck, and you've got five hundred dollars worth of stuff in your car. Costco knows what's going on. You paid for that free lunch. But we take the kids, and then my eyes locked onto this too. And I was like, "You're so." I said to my wife, "Put the kids in the car." She puts them up. What's my sister? She goes, "What's my sister?" That guy's possessed. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and we knew exactly what the other one was. There was no question in my mind about it. A little while later, we got up to pay for all that free food and, you know, <laughs> a giant. Did you notice that the, the shopping carriages there were like barges? Have you noticed that? And, and that guy had a buddy of his, like, I won't describe, but the guy was wearing like flamboyant pink satin pants, and this guy was really crazy. And these two were nice. I just mean. A, you just know, man, when you come up against it, it's, it exists. Out on the beach in San Diego, and then the witnessing to the homeless people, man, there's some crazy, crazy stuff in the world. Something you really see, and you, you kind of come away from it, whoa, you know. The spiritual war is real. And you've got to kind of tune in. You've got to fight for that. You know, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Amen? Amen. That means, listen, turn to, to your right or to your left, look at your spouse and say, you are not the enemy. You're not the enemy. Craig, you are not the enemy. I can help my spouse, but you're not the enemy. <laughs> and the guy behind you who has the horrible voice who is singing worship, he isn't the enemy. And your boss at work isn't the enemy. There's a real enemy. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell. And it's fine for you, for your soul. And you don't war against one another. You war against that. Spiritual forces of wickedness in political places. Amen? Amen. <laughs> but maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll leave that whole presidential race alone at this point. We're going to pass. Verse 17, this became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So that means that people in the area were hearing of the, sacred, the seven naked sons of Siva. They had heard about the miracles that were, were happening in Paul's ministry. They heard about the demonic things and the fake things too. And they became all the more respectful, reverentially fearing the Lord. And it says, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Amen. All that his name is magnified now. His other names, Clinton, Trump, and this. And I'm not poking fun at any of that. I'm saying that we get so wrapped up in other names, we really forget what's important. And while the presidential race is important, yet yeah, there's someone who's much more important. Amen? Amen. Don't neglect him. Let his name be magnified. I'm only on this, like, in this world for a short time. Very short now. Time's only getting shorter. I, I'm actually one, step, one day closer to heaven than I was yesterday. I don't know about you, but certainly the case with me. Let the name of Jesus Christ be magnified. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Amen? Amen. No other name. Not Clinton or Trump. He's not going to save anybody. But there is one who saves. Jesus Christ. Now, verse 18. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So people are hearing the name of Jesus Christ. They're coming to faith. They're believing the gospel. And now they come and they're confessing their sins. I don't recommend you just go down the street and say, hey, I was a this or I was a that. But it certainly seems within the context of the church, people are being open and honest about their sin. Living in the light, not in the dark. More and more people are coming to faith here. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. 
See, here's the evidence, gang, of a true faith. These new believers confessed their sin, and then they took those things that they had in their lives, contrary to Jesus Christ, and they burned them. Wow. What a novel idea. Isn't really that... When we come to faith in Jesus, shouldn't we disavow those things contrary to Jesus? They took all their black magic art books, spells, or whatever it is they have there. Harry Potter movies or something. I don't know. I'm just... That was throwing you, Christine. I'm just messing with you. I'm just totally kidding with you. I don't have a problem with Harry Potter. You know? So, as long as he doesn't visit my house, we'll be fine. So, I'm just kidding. Wow, you guys are... Is there a bunch of Harry Potter fans here or something like that? I'm just messing with you, honestly. There's not, no ill will in you. But they took their black magic junk. And it must have been fairly expensive because it says 50,000 pieces of silver. I don't know what a silver coin in, that, in Ephesus was actually worth. Some say it could have totaled into the millions of dollars. It amazes me what some people would spend good money on. Amen? But they took those things contrary to Jesus and they got rid of them. See, they didn't just pro pro proclaim a love for Jesus. They determined to hate those things that Jesus doesn't like too. And that is one of those things that's killing the church today. It's we become to faith in Jesus. But we won't walk away from those things that are contrary to Him. And we want to watch them at the movie houses and call it artistic license. Oh, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Those worthless shepherds, says Ezekiel. In your own life, I'm going to ask you, in your mind, even now, close your eyes if you dare, and just inventory your house, and inventory your daytime, and look at what's in your closets, and look at the things that are sort of reflected in your checkbook, and say, Lord, are you pleased with these things? Or are these things contrary to you? You see, we've been given righteousness in Christ, amen? Positionally, I'm righteous. There's nothing I can do to add to it. But I am also called, in response to the righteousness that has been imputed to me, to walk in righteousness practically. Not because it's going to earn my way to heaven. It does nothing to earn my way to heaven. But it's a loving response to what He's given me. So listen, and throwing out whatever those things are that are contrary to the Lord isn't going to make you more righteous positionally, you can't add to that. Jesus is righteous enough. Amen? Amen. Clearly, he said on the cross, it was finished. But in response to the love of God, for heaven's sake, shouldn't we turn our back on that other journey? And if you don't, it's going to hold you back. It's going to pull you down. Things that you're called to sail across are going to pull you up. And hinder your walk. You know, if you're going to pick up the cross, there's just some things you're going to have to let go of because it takes two hands to carry the cross. Amen? Amen. You're going to have to let go of a few things. It's okay. There's nothing that I've placed on the altar that I've ever regretted for you. Some things the Lord has given back to me and said, I want you to manage this for me. Some things He says, thank you, that's my mind. But I don't regret any of them. You know? I, I, I don't believe it's the business of the church to tell you that you're rated our movies, you need to throw those out. Or your romance novels, or whatever you happen to have. I, I don't believe that's the business of the church. I think it's the business of the church to exhort you to follow the Holy Spirit's lead in your life. And then in doing so, in responding to that love of God personally, not the rules of the church per se, you'll find 